Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the next theme of um, the BFMPC and CHSC Professional Learning Series. And I think today we start with the exciting topic that everyone has been debating about academic integrity and so forth, um, um, segueing from last week um, around AI in education into this um, topic of academic integrity. And for this, I would like to introduce Marika Kleitz from the C, um, from CLM that works in postgraduate writing um, to present this, um, yeah, the theme in its three parts. And as you can see, the the topics there um, for the three sessions. So today is a journal club, and it's focused on reimagining academic integrity through the lenses of ethics of care and restorative justice. Thank you, Marika, for joining us. Over to you. Uh, thanks so much, Janis. I really appreciate it. I'm going to turn my camera off in a second. I'm load shedding at the moment, so I don't want to drop off the call, but I just wanted to show my face today. So uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us today and uh, for inviting me and having me. Um, as Janis mentioned, the first part today is a journal club, which is based on a chapter that um, the two of us wrote together and that will be published in uh, June this year in our book. So we're very proud of it, but it's uh, at this point very much a conceptual paper. And um, that's that's kind of also part of the planning for this entire series is we have these ideas that we would really very much like to share with the group. And then in parts two and three, we will think about it as a group, whether these um, ideas are practicable and applicable in our society, in our community of higher education, in our communities and faculties, etc., with our students. So um, we're very much looking forward to this. And also thank you so much um, for having us. And um, I'm very excited to hear your opinions about these ideas um, and we're welcoming any type of uh, input on it with a, um, any critical um, input would be much appreciated. So I'm going to turn my camera off now. Um, so as Janis mentioned, um, we are looking at a journal club. I've put both our names here because we both wrote the um, chapter. So I, I feel I can't just put my name to it. So. Um, it's about reimagining academic integrity through the lenses of ethics of care and restorative justice to establish a culture of academic integrity. And the idea of academic integrity is becoming more and more um, um, necessary to have these discussions um, as our landscape keeps on shifting. So everything or of all the sessions that has gone before this one has looked at AI in education and how that has changed um, our landscape um, considerably. And um, maybe if we look at this um, um, graphic that I have on the screen now, it's not there, of course, at the moment, but maybe if we look at something like learning context, um, AI like ChatGPT and Midjourney and all of those other lovely uh, and interesting and sometimes scary things uh, that is happening in the artificial intelligence world should fit into the learning context as well. So, um, We'll touch on it as we move along, but uh, I, I want to start us off, off with two questions while looking at this graphic. And I'm not going to give you time to really answer it, but it is something that I would very much appreciate you to think about. And um, maybe it's something that we can pick up again in our sessions um, uh, later on in March. So my first question to you is to what extent as breaches in academic integrity an individual problem? And to what extent is breaches of academic integrity an institutional problem? So it's weighing these two um, up against each other. Um, so that's something to think about as we move through the presentation, but also something to discuss in the two later sessions. So, I think we should reframe from the individual 
to the collective, but that's my personal opinion. Um, in many areas, we see how learning and mastery are linked to collective endeavor. So some people in this room may belong to a variety of communities of practice. Um, in my own field of work, I, I see um, that writing group. So as Janis mentioned, I, I work in CLM and I work with postgraduate students um, to develop their writing. So in that space, I see that writing groups provide students with safe spaces to develop their writing agency and identity. So these are all these are spaces for learning and as such, it's OK to make a mistake. Um, but in general, uh, we don't have that community framing when it comes to integrity uh, or academic integrity. It's almost not OK to make a mistake. We ask students to sign plagiarism declarations so that we can punish them more easily. We tell them not to cheat or they will be punished. And then we leave them to their own devices. So another rhetorical question, if we just think about that situation, isn't that frightening? And then another rhetorical question, isn't that criminal on our part? So in the academic integrity spaces, there's a lot of talk about um, community and that something like integrity cannot happen in a vacuum. We have to build a culture of academic integrity in a community. It, it can't just be rules. It can't just be thou shalt do X, Y, and Z, or thou shalt be punished. So how do we build a community of academic integrity in our institution? The first step, of course, is to understand our students and to understand, and that's the point of the graphic on the screen at the moment, is that we cannot take a decontextualized approach to um, academic integrity. We have to take into account the various levels and the various factors that might play a role in a student um, making use of dishonest practices. And and there's so many things about it. Um, so it could be um, the students' um, individual um, understanding of academic conventions and the development of intrinsic motivation. Um, there might be pressures to perform. We all know um, that there's various socioeconomic pressures on students to perform. Um, with and funding being cut, uh, we are kind of experiencing that at the moment. So there's all types of pressures for students to perform at university. And if if we don't take into account that these pressures do have a, 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 an effect on students' decision making, we can't truly um, help them. And th that's the point of um, kind of pitching the idea of a restorative justice approach and an ethics of care approach because we want to place the student in the center of these types of things so that it's not just a, a legalistic approach to um, punishment. So uh, there are, like we said, various um, things that we've, uh, that um, influences students. Um, so we feel in in this article that we um, need to reimagine uh, the student experience in higher education and this of course requires a culture shift and that shift needs to happen on multiple fronts um, because the student experience is not one dimensional it's like we said there are various factors that um, influence students decisions um, and we have to take those factors and dimensions into account. So one of these dimensions uh, where we need to rethink the culture and attitudes for both staff and students is around academic integrity. Uh, and it's, it's important to reestablish it or rethink it, uh, it, not just for students, but for staff as well. We have a tendency or not us, um, our policies have a tendency to 
say that this is only something that is relevant to students because the rest of us don't um, plagiarize or have any forms of misconduct and we truly do hope that is the case but um, it, in my opinion it is not correct to do that separation because then we're not one community but it's something for students and something for staff which is is in my opinion completely wrong so we have to bring that together um so that's why it's in, important to have a combined culture between for both staff and students uh, we need to understand the student context of course and their needs uh, we need to adapt our culture and curricula to be transformational. We can't just accept, expect that students should just fall into our ways of thinking and doing. We have to question whether our ways of thinking and doing is still the right way. Um, nothing in life is static and we have to change with the tides as well. Um, so for the um, proposed chapter, we feel that um, that change should be around how we help students to learn. Um, that could be linked to our administration processes, as you'll see on the right hand side of the screen, and that support that we provide to students in an administrative um, component. With regards to academic integrity and dishonesty, we should rethink what it is um, at the what is at the heart of our culture is it justice is it to punish what what is our current culture should the time at university uh, not be spent learning and growing and providing those spaces and if we don't provide a, a space where it's okay to make a mistake with regard to academic integrity um then how are we really helping students to learn and grow? Um, so we are advocating for a bit of a softer approach to the existing practices in higher education when it comes to um, academic integrity and academic misconduct. And um, that's why we um, kind of settled on ethics of care and restorative justice. So there's a lot to say about ethics of care, and I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna try and just pick up the the most important bits on it. But um, we do think that this is an important lens through which to consider the establishment of a culture of academic integrity, um, because it helps us to take a student-centered approach to dealing with academic dishonesty when the need arises. So for most institutions and for most South African, let's frame it like that. I've been looking at a few universities and um, plagiarism policies and things just to have a look at what's out there. And most institutions in um, the South African context still positions punishment as the um, kind of main driver of um, and the main concept of their policies. Um, so there's not a lot of thinking around caring for students or meeting their support and developmental needs when it comes to academic integrity, because academic integrity isn't just something that falls out of the sky. Just like any other type of skill, it is something that is learned. It is a community based aspect. And if we don't um, help students understand our communities practices, we, we can't really be angry at them for breaking those practices. Um, so it's important for us as an institution to shift uh, our thinking and practices in order to create supportive environments where students don't feel first they need to be dishonest to survive. Uh, one of the options uh, things here is that students might feel their courses are extremely overloaded, that they um, don't have enough time to 
really con um, connect with the study work and do the work that um, the only way to survive is to grab at something that will make it a little bit easier for them to um, do the work. So whether that is um, reusing somebody's old paper to write something for them, or even using something like ChatGPT to write for them. We first need to ask ourselves, do we create the environment where students feel that that is the only way to survive? Because if that is the case, again, maybe a controversial question, but if that is the case, isn't the problem or isn't the wrongdoer in that situation the institution and not the student? Um, so we need to focus on responsibilities and being very clear about whose responsibility is whose. And um, so that there's multiple support mechanisms for students. And that the first mechanism, of course, when it comes to integrity, that student meet shouldn't be a disciplinary, um, but we'll touch again on that later. Um, so in order to reimagine academic integrity, it's important to first establish a vision for transforming the organizational culture. And again, that's where the ethics of care and the um, restorative uh, justice approach comes in. And just to quickly link to that, the academic integrity framework that was published or um, that was passed by SET at the end of November last year, draws strongly on this idea of development. And the development um, is very much linked to the International Center for Academic Integrity Standards. And that is also reflected in the WITS Academic Integrity Framework. And that the sentiment there is that students, academics, and support staff all have a role to play in establishing a culture of integrity. And um, it also indicates that academics needs to um, be more explicit about the practices and take responsibility for the possible effects that um, their, their current practices might have to, to contributing to students um, uh, resorting to misconduct. Um, so, Tronto argues uh, that care is normally an undervalued activity uh, centered on the less powerful members of society, um, which in our case at institutional level, especially when we look at something like academic integrity and how policies are currently set up, would refer to our student cohort. Um, Tronto further argues that care about uh, should be uh, at the center of everything we do. And that is what we are trying to do with trying to with combining these two approaches um, is to really center everything on the student. Um, thus incorporation of these practices, um, we hope we, yeah, hope is maybe the best word. Um, we hope to um, rehumanize our students, not just to criminalize them, uh, and to make sure that they are treated fairly um, uh, when misconduct does happen. And that's kind of where the uh, restorative practice um, comes in. So, um, restorative justice. First off, um, it's based, of course, on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And as um, uh, Archbishop uh, Desmond Tutu said, the central concern is not retribution or punishment, but in the spirit of Ubuntu, the healing of breaches, the redressing of imbalances, the restoration of relationships. Thus, we should claim that justice, restorative justice, is being served when efforts are being made to work for healing, 
for forgiveness and for reconciliation. So we just want to have a little disclaimer at this point um, that um, the approach we're taking, we're calling it a restorative justice approach. So it draws strongly on the concepts um, from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but it is not a legal um, concept in, in any way or form. It doesn't have any legal um, structures to it. And that is quite deliberate. And um, if you go look at the literature around the restorative justice approach that is out there, there is um, a, a delinking at that point um, because most of the um, restorative or the most of the, the um, plagiarism and misconduct policies that are out there are pseudo legalistic. So it's uh, um, done in that way so that we can divorce, um, we can take the good principles without falling into our old tracks of punishment. So the point here truly is to reintegrate um, students into the society. So if we think about what um, current practices is when it comes to student um, punishment and misconduct, it is that students are placed outside of the society. They are punished uh, and uh, they are kind of signposted as, as somebody who has done wrong and that should be avoided like a leper. So the point here is to not leave our students in a leper society outside of our institutional um, structures, but to reintegrate them, to reconcile them into our system so that they can become um, stronger for it and our system can become stronger for it. So the key and core ideas of um, a restorative justice approach is of course still to discipline wrongdoing and here I'm taking very specifically the wording to not um, use misconduct or plagiarism um, because that, that creates a very um, specific picture of a student having done something because they are dishonest. Um, so I've very specifically decided to use the word wrongdoing and wrongdoers rather. So they did something wrong and um, we hope that that wrong can be righted in some way. So um, yeah, so sorry, I just lost my train of thought. So that's the idea of the wording. So it is also to create a supportive environment for students and staff in their personal development linked to the issue. So as mentioned earlier, um, it shouldn't be something that is a, a academic integrity uh, policies or misconduct policies, however you want to frame them, shouldn't just be something that is for students, it should be for all of us. Um, because like also, I hinted at earlier, but I haven't said it outright, so I'll say it outright now. Um, our actions could really um, could lead to students resorting to um, wrongdoing. So they um, might, because they have loaded courses with um, uh, too much reading and so forth, they um, they might, of course, do something just to keep their heads above water, to stay in the system. And then, in, to a certain extent, um, us as the institution or as staff members have a hand in that wrongdoing because we've overloaded the courses. And I know that is um, not something to uh, say lightly. I, I don't do that. Uh, it is um, a difficult thing to to talk about. So um, it's it's just like I said to just broaden the scope a little bit so that it's not just about the student, but it it could be something about the institution and course setup as well. So it draws on things like making inclusive decisions. Um, this means that all parties are involved. 
So we open the space for all parties to, to voice their feelings and articulate the harm caused and which sanctions are needed to repair the harm. So with that we mean if we take another, uh, if we take the example maybe of a student um, plagiarizing um, an essay because the, um, the course load was too difficult, we might say, OK, so um, the harm was caused by the student because they plagiarized, but the harm was also caused by the lecturer. Um, in another situation where a student might take questions, exam questions and post them on um, sites like Course Hero or whatever, um, the, the harmed parties might not just be the staff member because he, his or her questions were leaked, but it's also maybe the rest of the class because it means that that assessment that students um, completed is no longer something that can be used because the questions were leaked. So the students who did well in that and spent time on actually working on that, they were also harmed. So then it, it becomes, a, again, a community thing where um, the student who did the harm or the wrong um, is present, the staff member is present and maybe a class representative as well. Um, to represent all of the harmed parties. So active accountability. Um, here we talk about wrongdoers um, must take responsibility for their actions and make amends. So the person or persons um, who are responsible for the harm or the wrong must take active responsibility for their actions. Um, this kind of challenges the passive role that students may play in current structures where they receive um, a specific punishment linked to their transgression. Uh, as well as the view that only the student is responsible for the harm caused, that is also challenged because um, here we can say hypothetically that um, there were other reasons for the harm and uh, other factors that um, played a role. So what active accountability does is it meets the need of um, productive community accountability. And by incorporating the student's voice and opinions on how to address the situation, um, they are also more likely to adhere to the decisions made as they may, may feel less kind of forced or um, or maybe punished, um, or feel that the punishment is arbitrary. So in that way, you also develop self-regulation through the process. So um, if uh, you take this restorative practice approach, like we said, all harmed parties would be um, present, and we would also have kind of a facilitator, restorative practice facilitator, at hand to keep the discussion going. And again, very specifically, it's a discussion, not a disciplinary. Um, and then the accountability might be, let's say in the example where the student posted, uh, leaked the questions um, to um, a, a, a larger site. Um, the, the accountability, what might have to happen is the student might have to apologize to his or her classmates and also in some way kind of demonstrate that they are sorry so that and that demonstration could be um, anything that is decided in that group um, guided by the facilitator and then of course um, there might also be a, a further punishment like getting zero for the assignment or the test or whatever that might have been, that assessment. But there is an opportunity to reintegrate and become part of that group again. And that's what the active accountability does. Um, then for repairing harm, the focus is on reparation in order to encourage wrongdoers um, um, personal growth and also to provide them with an opportunity and a space to learn. So 
this situa situates sorry, the problem uh, rather than the person as the issue that needs to be addressed. Um, so uh, that is, I think, an important shift um, from saying that somebody is a bad egg to somebody did something wrong and it can be mended. Um, so what this does, of course, it is it allows for the student to be reintegrated into the academic community. And then the last step or the last pillar of restorative practice is through building trust. So this is provides the opportunity for the wrongdoer to regain the trust of the harmed parties. Um, this can take many forms, allowing for educational experiences or discussions, resource sharing, and of course also when necessary, harsh, harsher punishments as possible ways to rebuild that trust. Um, so at university level, restorative practice has been used uh, to mediate issues of student misconduct. It's actually very sad for me to hear that um, most literature about restorative practice um, for academic misconduct um, is, is of course based on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but um, it was first done by American universities, and, I, and then and that's the part that I'm sad about. Is um, why 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 did we discard this this practice, this way of doing so easily? Uh, why didn't we uh, think about it uh, or consider it as uh, an option in in our situation in our um, institutions? So, the literature which is mostly American, shows different ways in which restorative practice um, ha have been constituted at universities. So it has been done in small groups media mediated by restorative practice practitioner. Um, it might be through restorative practice committees or restorative practice circles. Um, and all of these are then led by a restorative practice facilitator or practitioner. And it really depends on the, the formality within the university structure, whether it is a, comedy, a, a committee or a circle or a discussion. Um, and if we look at maybe the current structures at um, BITS and how our current uh, policies are set up, the most the easiest way if we decide to go in this type of direction is to do a, a restorative practice committee because we already have academic misconduct committees or the 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 um uh reason or, or one might reason that um maybe we should uh, because we've had committees before not do committees again because otherwise it's just too easy to just stick an, a new name on it but continue with practices that are already entrenched so maybe to change it then to a circle or a discussion um either way uh, the implementation of these structures is context dependent. So yes, it could be a committee or a circle, um, but maybe we should uh, break with our context and do the, the complete opposite. Um, so, but what is important, whether it's a committee or a circle or a discussion, um, it's important to make decisions inclusively um, because if, if we don't do that, there's actually no point in this. Um, and it's very important that the process is mediated, uh, that the process considers that that mediation considers um, all the voices in the room, all the views and all of the perspectives of all of the stakeholders at that specific um, um, space. Because if one voice is weighted, um, more strongly than the other, then um, we create hierarchies again. And the point of this is to put everyone on a, a level playing field so that we can um, address an issue and not address 
a person, like I said, it's not that a person is a bad person, it's that a person did something wrong and that's the wrong that should be addressed. So just as a comparison, um, on the right hand side we have the traditional disciplinary um, of uh, our institutions. So it is more like a criminal court. You have to go prove your innocence. It's procedure centered. You have to um, submit these documents and you have to appear here. And um, the documents do most of the talking and not the people. Um, it identifies, of course, also a code violation. So you um, plagiarized or you falsified or you whatever um, your document, um, your actions. So we identify that as a code violation and it of course limits participation. So um, a student will have limited amount of time to speak and then uh, a verdict is provided. And then also the membership is usually limited. So it would just be the student standing in front of a committee. With the restorative practice approach, um, it is more like mediation. So of course that means that it's people-centered, so it's not about, um, have, it, it, it will have of course a procedure, but it is about putting the people in the center of that procedure, not the procedure in the center of the people, I guess that's the, that's the flip of it. And therefore it's about identifying harm, not identifying who did some, uh, who is the wrong person, and then addressing that uh, through participation, through, through a student being able to say why something happened, and um, for all parties then to interact with that. That of course strengthens membership and it strengthens membership afterwards as well, since it's easier for the student to reintegrate into the society uh, rather than to um, be, like I said earlier, and I said it as a joke, but um, I guess it's not that much of a joke if it's there's a, a stitch of truth in it for students to be sent to a leper colony afterwards. Um, so uh, those are the, the two main ideas that we have um, for you here. Um, I'm going to just stop sharing for a second. Um, OK, and coming back to the room. Um, I would like to just kind of get people's feelings and ideas around this. I know for uh, sessions later on, uh, the next two sessions in the series will really dive deeper into this um, and discuss it and the, uh, see whether it is applicable or not. Um, but at this point, um, I would like to invite any uh, questions that you might have about this um, that, that is kind of um, boggling your mind a bit or that you feel is unclear at this moment. Uh, that may, might make it easier to segue into um, our session next week. Uh, Mervyn, please uh, unmute and ask your question. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much. This is obviously a very complex subject and a very emotional one. But yes. one um, immediately thinks of the reverse set of circumstances. We're always talking about what if the student does something wrong? But mm. what redress has the student if his educator or the institution acts 
unethically or irresponsibly? Yes. How does one deal with this process? Yes, so so that is uh, the, kind of the, the sticky wicket of it. And uh, that's what we hoped Janus and I to address with the chapter is that it's not just something that should be focused on students, uh, that it is something that we all have a hand in. And if um, something, um, if, if the institution or a lecturer um, plays a role in, in um, creating that circumstances where a student was, did something wrong, um, who, uh, the student cannot be the only one, and I'm saying this in very loosely, quote unquote, should not be the only one that should be punished. Um, so then does it become hypothetically, if it is a course that is overloaded, um, does that mean maybe that lecturers should go to um, developmental um, um, practices or, or educational practices um, that is involved uh, that is available in faculty or at the institution about how to structure and develop courses? Uh, that might be a way um, to do that. So it, again, the, the point is not to punish in the strict sense of the word, but that um, it, it creates a community. So if the course is overloaded now for this student, it will be overloaded in the future as well. So in that way, then we create a, um, a, a more just society. Janis, I saw your hand pop up. Uh, do you want to come in? No, that was actually an accident. But the, <laughs> um, just, just on that is that um, so what we, for example, um, what we, for example, thought um, as well is that if it's, for example, uh, the, the course overload that Marika spoke about, um, that the student would then work and partner with the academic to actually look at how can curriculum change be facilitated and so forth. Um, so, so that could be part of the punishment um, for the student. <laughs> but also sort of like work punishing, but not punishment for the lecture, but but to, to um, you know, the lecture basically needs to relook at the, um, the curriculum um, to make sure that academic uh, um, integrity issues later doesn't occur again. But in terms of your question around academic, um, well, ethics, from from a staff perspective, Merwin, I think that is something that we still really need to explore. I recently read the article by the Stellenbosch University students um, for um, the ethics proposal that I'm currently writing on the student journey mapping um, around all the, you know, the the bullying and victimization and, and, and so forth. And I think um, in the clinical spaces, and I think we need to we we still need to think about that, um, but but you know in terms of academic integrity and and so forth. So there's still a lot to unpack, and I don't think we have the answers yet. But but I think this is a, a stepping stone to start thinking about those things. Mm. Yes, um, Janis, um, can I uh, share the 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 draft of the article or the chapter in the chat? Yes, please do. Thanks, Marika. Just quickly grab it here. OK, so um, it should pop up any moment on your side. I've um, uh, shared the, the draft of the chapter that this um, journal club was based on. So um, it in more detail unpacks the ethics of care uh, and uh, the restorative practice approach um, that, that we um, are advocating for. And um, I, 
I don't like giving homework <laughs> and um, so forth, but um, we will um, make use of these um, ideas in, in the chapter for the next two sessions. So um, if, if you could scan through it, I, I know it's a lengthy chapter. Um, we had a lot of things to say and a lot of ideas. Um, it would be uh, lovely for you to have a look at it. Um, so um, is there anything in the chat that I missed? Uh, uh, OK, so I, I don't want to um, kind of continue from this point onwards, Yannis. I thought I would maybe be a bit longer than I was. Um, I think I, I talked a bit fast. Um, so um, that's all I would like to share um, for today. And then uh, we'll, we'll kick off um, uh, the next session with kind of some, uh, some scenarios to just jog our, our minds again about these two um, ideas and how they can be applied. And then we'll kind of brainstorm further about uh, how this is applicable and useful. Uh, within our spaces or not. Uh, we could at the end of all of this come to the point where we say, ah, oh, this is not going to work at all. And um, at least then we explored the idea and we could cross that off our list, off our list and then we can see what other approaches um, could possibly work better. So um, on that point, Janis, can I give back to you? Yes, thanks, Marika. Um, I, I see Christine. Oh, OK, no, she just wanted to make a um, comment around having lots of thoughts. Thank you for the interesting session. And yeah, I just also want to echo that. Thank you, Marika, for starting this off. I think it's a very important conversation and and it's um, I agree with Ania and Christine that it was a lovely presentation. Um, and yeah, we're looking forward to the to the next session. I actually also learned a, like a bit um, revisiting some of the concepts from your from your presentation. So thanks so much for that. And yeah, um, looking forward to next week. And um, hope all of you have a wonderful um, Tuesday afternoon. Thanks again. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye.